Good afternoon. Um, I'm, we'll go ahead and get started with today's Grand Rounds. Um, I'm excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lafia, who is a geriatrician currently practicing at UH in the inpatient, outpatient, home, post-acute care, and nursing facility settings. She is the medical director of the Judson Senior Living Communities, including Judson Park Skilled Nursing Unit and Judson Hospice. She is also the medical director of Foley Elder Health and the program director of the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship. And with that, I will invite up our speaker, Dr. Lafia. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk to you all today. For those of you who have worked with me in the past, you know that medications and polypharmacy is something that is really important to me, very near and dear to my heart because it is a, an issue that we see everywhere in every setting uh, and particularly with our older patients. And I, I could talk for two hours about this topic, but I've tried to narrow it down as best as I could. Uh, so after today's talk, I hope that you will all be able to, number one, define polypharmacy, but also to describe the influence of age uh, on how medications work within the body, both ph pharmacodynamics and kinetics. And also that you'll be able to identify what we call in geriatrics PIMS or potentially inappropriate medications in older adults and also be able to start utilizing strategies to help reduce polypharmacy and to recognize when it's important to reconcile medications. Well, always it is important. Um, so, here we go. Polypharmacy has a number of different definitions. It is not what my son, my 12 year old son said yesterday. He commented, oh, does that mean it's a, it's a pharmacy with five sides? Well, sort of, not too far off. Um, the most common definition is that uh, taking five or more medications, but that also includes any medication, any PRN meds and over-the-counter medications. Uh, also, you could consider it polypharmacy if you have a patient taking two or more medications of the same class. And often this occurs with uh, the psychoactive medications, neurologic medications, um, depression medicines and cardiac medications. Uh, and then also occasionally you have patients taking um, medications of, uh, um, uh, so different classes for the same indications is what I mentioned previously. Less frequently, you'll see the same class of medication um, in two or more meds. Uh, and, and also polypharmacy generally can be taking at least one medication that's not indicated. So why does polypharmacy happen? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but the main reason is that as our patients get older, they often have multiple chronic medical conditions. So multimorbidities is usually the main reason, but we also get into this prescribing cascade where you treat a patient with a medication, then they come back a couple months later with a new complaint and in, instead of thinking that this complaint could potentially be related to a prior medicine, it, it's treated as a new problem and so often a new medication is given. Also, we have the issue that there are many cooks in the kitchen. Our patients are seeing multiple different providers and often from different health systems. And then we, we struggle with the issue of inaccurate medication lists, which is usually 99% of the, of the time. Um, and, and then also, I very often see that just in general, there's often a hesitancy to, to question medications that a patient's on or to change them, especially if they've been on them for a while or they've been prescribed by other physicians. So this is just an example of a prescribing cascade. There could be many, but let's just say you see a patient who's on amlodipine and atorvastatin. And, um, they start to develop leg swelling. So they get a, uh, a diuretic, furosemide and potassium um, because of the diuretic. And then a little bit later, they complaining of constipation. So they're given fiber and a stool softener to help with their bowels. Um, if they're kind of dried out, they may start to have a little bit of lightheadedness. 
maybe from being dried out and also the effects of the, uh, the um, antihypertensive. So then they start taking meclizine to help with the dizziness. Um, and later on, there's some mention of forgetfulness. So they're given denepazil for um, memory loss. And then they, they're complaining of now they have loose stools and also urinary frequency. And so later they're put on oxybutynine to help with urinary incontinence. This is just one example. Like I said, there are many. So as we know, there um, the population of adults over the age of 65 is rapidly growing. And there's currently around 60 million. Uh, and 90% um, of adults over 65 are on at least one medication. 30 to 40% are on five or more. And it's estimated that older adults use one third of all prescriptions that are, are prescribed throughout the country and 40% of all non-prescription medications. So what are the consequences of polypharmacy? Well, the, the most important consequence is adverse drug events, uh, which includes a risk for interactions between medications. The more medicines you're on, the more the likelihood of potential interactions between um, medicines. Also, the more medicines that a patient is on, the less likely that they're actually going to adhere and be taking the medications correctly. So you have greater risk for noncompliance. Being on multiple medicines can, that have potential side effects can lead to geriatric syndromes like falls, cognitive impairment, appetite changes and weight loss, um, even mood related changes. And then of course, it, it causes um, more use of healthcare and, and a lot of spending and cost, not to mention the fact that so many of our new medications are extremely expensive. So adverse drug reactions co come in, in many different um, uh, shapes and sizes. There's five categories be just the side effects, meaning the secondary effect of the, of the drug, often dose-related. Hypersensitivity is an immunologic response, uh, and anaphylaxis is in, in its most severe form. Idiosyncratic response is an unusual or atypical reaction to a medication. And then toxic reactions uh, happen for a variety of reasons, and it's, it's often dose-related and duration-related. And then of course, potential uh, interactions between medications. So adverse drug events are any injury resulting from the use of a medication. And a, a adverse drug reaction is considered a type of drug event, adverse drug event. Uh, and it's estimated that anywhere between five to 28% of acute admissions in older adults is related to um, these adverse events. Uh, and about 100,000 hospitalizations per year for ADEs. And adults who are over 80 years old, they make up the majority of these particular hospitalizations. And the, the most important fact is that many of these adverse drug events are preventable. What um, risk factors are there for having an adverse drug event? Greater age, particularly over the age of 80, having a lower BMI, having a creatinine clearance, particularly less than 30, and the, the number of medications that you're on. If you're on over nine medications or over 12 administrations of medications per day, you're at a much greater risk of having an adverse drug event. And um, like I said, many of these adverse drug events can be preventable. The most common offenders are our cardiovascular drugs, diuretics, NSAIDs, anti-diabetes medications, particularly from them causing uh, hypoglycemia, but also there's other newer side effects from our uh, newer medications, uh, second generation antipsychotics, as well as first generation, and anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications. So drug interactions can occur in a number of different ways, most commonly drug-drug interaction, but also drugs can interact with particular diseases. So there are certain conditions or diseases that may contraindicate prescription of certain meds. For example, 
like the prescription of denepazil for memory loss, it really should be avoided in somebody who already is having bradycardia or a history of syncope. It's similar for um, uh, um, any rate control medications. There's also the potential for a drug nutrient interaction, like for example, warfarin and vitamin K rich foods. And then we, we do also forget about the potential for drugs interact, interacting with herbs and supplements. The polyherbacy is a real thing. You know, I'm sure that you all have seen patients who are on many different supplements and, and vitamins and herbal medicines, none of which are uh, FDA controlled or regulated. And one example of a drug and herb interaction is St. John's wort with any SSRI. So drug to drug interactions, the reason for the interactions, it could be that one of the medications impairs the other's absorption. It could be that they have similar effects, which then cause exaggerated effects of the medications, or they could have opposite effects. And then reduce effect of the medication. You also have medicines that can affect e each other's metabolism by either inhibiting metabolism or inducing metabolism. And again, the risk for interactions increases with the number of medicines that a patient is on. The most common side effect of these drug interactions is a neuropsychological reaction um, and most commonly delirium. Uh, tremor is also something that's very common, as well as gait impairment. And it's cardiovascular and psychotropic drugs that are most likely to have drug-drug interactions. So let's talk a little bit about pharmacokinetics and, and pharmacodynamics. So we're going to bring you back in time to your medical school uh, education here. So pharmacokinetics is how a body handles a drug. So this is both, this is absorption, volume and distribution, metabolism and excretion. So what changes occur with aging? So with absorption, uh, when you take a medication orally, the, there really isn't a change with age in terms of absorption, but when you add changes, other changes uh, in um, physiology from certain conditions, um, that can then affect absorption. You do see delayed gastric emptying, emptying and, and slower motility as we get older, but then also there are some medications that actually can speed up motility and then can affect absorption. And, and then of course, um, our stomach pH can be altered most commonly by proton pump inhibitors. There really is no change uh, with age in terms of absorption from IV uh, administration, but with IM, there is there could be a decreased absorption and um, a, uh, it can occur erratically. Um, same thing with topical medications. As we get older, our epidermis atrophies um, and um, you can get abnormal and inconsistent absorption from topical medications. Um, and it, it could vary between patients and within a patient, depending on where in the body a medication is placed. And same with inhalation, you can have a decreased absorption with age because of decreased chest wall compliance and alveolar surface area. The volume of distribution um, changes in older adults because uh, generally, the total body water and muscle mass decrease, whereas fat increases as we get older. So when muscle mass and total body water is decreased, this, uh, this decreases the volume of distribution of waterphilic or hydrophilic medications. For example, ethanol, morphine, digoxin, uh, these medications are... Um, uh, water soluble, and so they have a, um, a less volume of distribution as as we get older, which means that they um, uh, um, it takes much less time to re reach a peak effect, and also potentially you can have quicker clearance. But we we add on other complicating factors, um, uh, including metabolism and excretion, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, fat-soluble medications, 
like lorazepam and trazodone, they, their volume of distribution increases as we get older, um, which means that they could be around for longer periods of time and, and um, uh, uh, excretion removal can take longer. Um, plasma albumin tends to de decrease as we get older. So this means then, then that, that medications that bind to albumin, um, you will start to see greater uh, increased amounts of free drug present. Uh, so for instance, dilantin uh, or phenytoin, valproic acid, lorazepam, these medications are all protein bound. And as we get older, if there's less albumin, that means that the, the sensitivity to these medications can be much greater. And, and it's part of the reason why we really need to start with lower doses for medications as we get older particularly these um, classes of medications. So with metabolism, it's really just the um, phase one metabolism that changes with age. And this is because liver mass decreases, hepatic blood flow decreases as we get older. And, and you do see some changes in the cytochrome P450 uh, metabolism. Um, and um, so, so this can cause decreased medication inactivation and clearance, which can lead to greater risk of side effects. In terms of excretion, there are, there are age-related changes that affect the kidneys. There's reduction in nephrons and renal mass, uh, decreased blood flow in the cortex, and every year the creatinine clearance decreases as we get older. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that the decreased muscle mass and inactivity that we see in a lot of our older adults can actually make it look like their kidney function is better than it actually is. It can lead to more within normal limits creatinine levels. Um, and, and so it, it, it might make you think that their kidney function is okay and I can prescribe medications at normal dose. And that might not necessarily be the case. And it's, it's why we often really talk about using the cockcroft galt equation for determining creatinine clearance in older adults. So pharmacodynamics is how a drug affects the body. And there are multiple changes as we get older because there's changes in um, how our receptors in our bodies, how um, they, uh, can um, interact with medications, um, decreased affinity. There might be changes in the numbers of receptors um, and post-receptor alterations, um, as well as impairment in, in general homeostasis. So some examples of pharmacodynamic changes of aging that affect medicines include with benzodiazepines and anticholinergics. And in um, general, we tend to be um, much more sensitive to these medications as we get older. Uh, with opioids, there are changes in mu sensitivity, um, and um, particularly you hear about morphine and about how um, morphine's effect potentially can last longer for older adults than in younger adults. Um, and then also with cardiac medicines, there's altered alpha and beta functioning. So when we talk about prescribing, the, the classic pearl um, or mnemonic is master. So it's important that we minimize prescribing. Whenever you're going to prescribe a medication, the first thing that you should think of is, is this really necessary? And weigh the, the benefits and the risks. Are the potential benefits actually going to outweigh the risks of the medication? And it's important to try to avoid starting more than one medication at once if, if you can. And, and it's always good to look at alternatives. Is there anything else that I could be doing? You know, particularly when it comes to older adults and, and um, psychological and behavioral issues, particularly in dementia. You know, could, is there non-pharmacologic um, uh, treatments that we could be pursuing? Um, and if you are gonna start a medication, you want to start low and go slow. It's important to first always look at the actual medication list of that you have for the patient, make sure it's correct, find out what they're actually taking and how they're taking it, and, um, and think about the changes in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Um, start low and go slow, um, and very important, and, and titrate up as, as indicated. 
generally we want to find the lowest tolerated dose that provides a benefit. Um, and it's important to talk to your, your patients and families, first and foremost, about what they're actually taking, how they're taking medicines. Now, many patients have concerns about taking too many medications, about taking them too often. If we prescribe medicines over two times a day, there's, there's a good chance that patients are not gonna take them a, a, as prescribed. Um, or as often as prescribed. So you, you really do wanna educate, talk, talk to your patients of why it's being prescribed, what potential side effects are. And then every time you see your patient, it's important to review those medications um, and, um, and, and others as well to see if there's actually any benefit or any change. Um, and and um, I see all too often that providers often just uh, assume that patients are taking medications that they prescribed in the past. And, and so often patients change what they do. And that's why it's really important to go over the med list at every visit with the patients. So deprescribing is the tapering, withdrawing, or discontinuation of medications. Now this can be very beneficial, especially for our older patients. It leads to a, a decrease in polypharmacy, it can lead to adverse drug reactions and, and events, can lead to inappropriate and effective med use, less dry mouth, less falls, confusion and weight loss, and potentially decreased mortality, and that was supposed to be increased quality of life. Uh, I see very often in my hospice practice, and, and just in general, when I take patients off of medications, they actually start doing so much better. There's so much, they can be more functional, they can be um, more, um, you know, uh, more alert, more um, interactive, and, and they feel better, less tired, less lightheaded. Patients really appreciate that. Um, and, and I have had many patients that have enrolled in hospice, we take them off of medications, and then they start doing better, and often sometimes are then disenrolled from hospice. So there are a number of tools that are available to help you with uh, reducing medications. Uh, so um, the most commonly used tools are the stop and start and the beers criteria. So stop start, uh, and its full name is, is an, um, a mouthful, uh, but it, it was developed in 2008 in Ireland and was last updated in 2014. And this was validated in the inpatient setting. And it's based on physiologic symptoms. And what they look at are the com common widespread medications and they really emphasize drug interactions and, and duplicate medications. Um, currently, for the most recent uh, update, there's 80 stop and 34 stop, stop criteria, start criteria. Uh, so it is quite extensive. So the Beers criteria, uh, it has been supported by the American Geriatric Society, as well as uh, pharmacologic societies um, and the American Medical Directors Association or the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care. It was initially developed specifically for nursing home residents, but over time has become um, adapted and applied to all older adults. The last update was in 2019, but there is a current update pending that should be published either later this year or in 2024. All of their recommendations are evidence-based. I really do encourage you all to take a look at, at least at the, the last 2019 um, publication and, and look at the figures. They do have really um, great figures. You can put them up in your desk and it could be helpful for you. So um, the last uh, uh, um, update in 2019 included 53 medications or drug classes, and there were five main categories. So PIMS, potentially inappropriate medicines to avoid in older adults, PIMS to avoid within specific syndromes and diseases, PIMS just to be used with caution, and then 13 specific drug-drug interactions, and meds to avoid or dose adjust for kidney function. So just some examples, uh, magesterol or megase 
has been on the, the beers criteria for um, a number of iterations now because it, it really is not clear that it, it shows much benefit in appetite stimulation in older adults. And there, there is the potential increased risk for death as well as, as blood clots. Nitrofurantoin has potential multiple side effects and it's recommended to avoid in creatinine clearances less than 30. Um, metoclopramide or Reglan can cause delirium as well as tremors and often can lead to misdiagnosis of Parkinsonisms and then lead to prescription of uh, Parkinson's medications. Um, so this is recommended to avoid in older adults. Sliding scales is one of the newer additions from 2019. And, and what it refers to is use of sliding scales solely for management of blood sugar um, in the absence of use of basal and, and bolus insulin. Um, it, it, I see this unfortunately still so commonly, it's a knee jerk reflex when a patient is admitted to the hospital they, they were doing really well on their oral medications. Well, generally we stop all oral medications and, and start them on a sliding scale in the hospital. Um, or I've even seen patients who weren't on any medications and, and maybe have a history of diabetes and their last A1C was good, but yet they're still put on sliding scales in the hospital. The, the sliding scales don't improve the overall blood sugar control, and they really do increase risk for adverse events, um, particularly hypoglycemia. In the hospital, they really, you can't really trust the sugars that are checked as being fasting or postprandial because patients often, they're not eating well, they eat randomly, they miss their lunch and they eat it two hours later because they went for a test. Um, and to get a sliding scale, you're sticking your patients four to, to six times a day uh, or three times a day. So, and, and, and that's not comfortable. So, so I really encourage you to think about the sliding scales before you order them. Digoxin was also added in 2019 because um, it, it really should be a second line choice for use in heart failure and in AFib for older adults because the benefits are really not completely clear and there may be an increased risk for mortality. Antipsychotics, medications that you hear about all the time, the potential increased risk for stroke and mortality in older adults, particularly in adults with dementia. Um, they're uh, um, all either first generation or second generation. All of them have the potential increased risk for, um, for death uh, and, um, and all ha can have the potential for significant side effects. So we really should try to avoid them um, unless all, uh, all alternatives, particularly non-pharmacologic alternatives have been tried and have failed or the patient is at risk for harm. The other tip that I recommend to everybody is if you are gonna prescribe an antipsychotic, please make sure that you check what the half-life is for these medications and the time for onset. Can't tell you how often I see olanzapine or Zyprexa used every four hours at, or every six hours PRN for agitation. If that patient, that poor patient happened to get it um, four times in a day, that medication, the half-life of olanzapine is over 24 hours. The half-life of, of aripiprazole or Abilify is, is much greater than that. Um, and it depends on kidney function and whether or not a patient is a fast or slow metabolizer. These medications could be around for a long time. So, so just be cautious by how frequent you use medications PRN um, relative to their, uh, their half-life and, and um, time of onset. And then sulfonylureas was also a newer medication added to the 2019 beers, including glimepiride. And uh, glyburide, I apologize, glyburide was added. And, and then, um, uh, um, so the older, longer acting sulfonylurea should be avoided. And um, one thing I will say is that the, the beers criteria 
it's not meant to be a hard and fast, you know, avoid these medications at all costs for older adults. It's meant to be a guideline and just a, something to think about. There are times where I do have, I do prescribe medications that are on the beers criteria, but it's, it's a, it's a patient by patient basis. You know, I look at each individual and, and it's, it's weighing their risks and their benefits. And sometimes there really aren't any other alternatives and the benefits might potentially outweigh the risks. But that being said, still important to monitor uh, use of these medications for any potential side effects. So anticholinergic medications. I think at the, what, what I see most commonly is that we, we forget just how many medications have anticholinergic side effects. It is so many different classes of medicines. And it, it often is the most common toxicity that particularly affects older patients. 32% of nursing home patients and 13% of outpatients are prescribed two or more uh, anticholinergic medicines. And it has both central and peripheral effects. If you remember the, the uh, mnemonic, hot as a hair, dry as, oops, um, blind as a bat, red as a beet, mad as a hatter, and dry uh, as, a, as a bone. So, um, and this comes from the, the particular side effects of drying people out, dry mouth, decreased sweating, double vision, um, tachycardia, uh, urinary retention, constipation, and then also confusion um, and disorientation um, and, and orthostasis. So anticholinergic medicines, like I said, pretty much um, so many different medicines out there have can have significant anticholinergic burden. So with antidepressants, the TCAs notoriously uh, have potential um, burden um, amitriptyline is the worst of the tricyclic antidepressants. Paroxetine, in theory, classically, uh, we're taught that paroxetine of all the SSRIs may have the greatest potential for anticholinergic burden. Um, antiarrhythmics can potentially be anticholinergic. Of course, our antiemetics, um, our motion sickness and vertigo medications are antihistamines, and we really want to be careful about the um, first-generation antihistamines, uh, like diphenhydramine, doxylamine, hydroxazine. People forget that hydroxazine is anticholinergic. That's a, a antihistamine. Um, and H2 blockers uh, also. Um, antipsychotics, I have uh, talked about a little bit, but part of the problem, particularly quietapine and, ox and olanzapine, the reason why they're sedating is because of the anticholinergic burden. You have your bronchodilators like ipitropium, antispasmodics, um, all of the antispasm medications, um, not just hyoscyamine, but also um, your uh, cyclobenzaprine and um, methocarbamol, they're all anticholinergic. Um, overactive bladder medicines, your anti-muscarinics, oxybutynin is the worst in terms of anticholinergic side effects. And then your Parkinson's meds, the benztropine, which is meant to reduce the, some of the side effects of the dopaminergic meds, that is um, uh, anticholinergic. Um, so sedating me medications, just like anticholinergic meds, which um, often contribute to uh, the sedation, you see increased risk for cognitive impairment, falls, and of course, sedation. Um, and benzodiazepines, uh, all of them, but particularly the long-acting ones like diazepine which, or Valium, which thankfully we don't, I don't see used all that often anymore. Um, those really should be used cautiously. Um, and this is just an example of, of sedating drugs. I think the ones to keep in mind are the ones that we, we sometimes don't think about. For instance, like anticonvulsants, and I apologize that I have that twice, but important to remember, like gabapentin and valproic acid, um, our muscle relaxants, um, our opioids, uh, and um, even some SSRIs can be um, potentially uh, sedating. Um, and um, yeah. Um, so with falls, we know that sedatives and benzos and anticholinergics greatly increase risk of falls. 
But the ones that we don't think about um, are um, anti-seizure medications, independently increased risk for falls, antipsychotics, certain heart medications, um, especially the blood pressure medicines if we overdo control of blood pressure and then cause orthostasis um, and uh, antiarrhythmic medications um, and especially digoxin, all of them can potentially increase risk for falls as well as at all the antidepressants, all the SSRIs, SNRIs, they all independently increase risk for falling. Um, and they also can lower bone density, which can then increase the risk for fracture. Proton pump inhibitors um, also can increase risk for fractures. Um, and then dementia medications. We often don't think of these as psychoactive, but they are. Pretty much any psychoactive medication can increase risk for falls and potentially um, uh, confusion. So briefly with glycemic control, I, I do encourage you all to look at the American Geriatric Society's Choosing Wisely campaign. Um, I believe that the, the fifth uh, recommendation really focuses on diabetes management. In general, it has been shown that as we get older, the, the benefit from tight glycemic control really decreases and you have a much greater increased risk for falls and mortality. Uh, and so generally, um, we, we advise against reducing the A1C for a patient with diabetes below seven with medication other than potentially metformin and possibly now the newer um, uh, medications, your SGLT2 uh, inhibitors and the GLP-1 um, agonists. Um, so the goal for an A1C for your patient, it should be individualized and it should be based on their comorbidities and their life expectancy. The, the, the more cr chronic medical problems that a patient has, and if their life expectancy is less than 10 years, it would it probably be absolutely fine to have a, um, uh, an A1C of less than eight, even potentially less than um, 8.5. We also nowadays are finding we really want to try to avoid sulfonylureas for um, a number of reasons and also avoid sliding scales. With proton pump inhibitors, um, these medications affect our cytochrome P450 um, genes, the, the CYP 2C19 and 3A4. They really should be used for short term, except for a few cases. There are now growing risk of um, uh, concern for adverse drug events, including increased risk for C. diff infection, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, uh, AKI and chronic kidney disease, fractures, um, and um, impaired absorption of nutrients and medicines with your vitamins, particularly and nutrients calcium, magnesium, vitamin B12, um, and iron all could be uh, affected by ha being on PPIs. And, and now they're, they're starting to be more concerned um, and, and more evidence of a, a potential link with um, dementia. So medicine reconciliation. Again, those of you who have, who have worked with me on the inpatient side, you know that I talk about this all the time because it's super important. Um, medical errors was the third cause of, a third leading cause of death in 2016. Um, and medication-related errors is the most common form of medical errors. Uh, and it, it's been shown to occur up to 60% um, uh, uh, during admission, discharge, or transitions. Um, and, and medicine reconciliation should occur everywhere and, and all the time, but particularly on admission to the hospital, discharge from the hospital, any transition of care, and each outpatient visit. So I am a, a sniffist. I do post-acute rehab care. And I can tell you that the majority of discharges that I receive from any hospital, the majority have at least one mistake in their medications in, in the discharge, whether it be they, um, the discharge summary and what is stated in the, in the summary is very different from what is chosen in the discharge med list or um, in medications that they were on previously 
was not included in, in the um, in the discharge list or ch um, changes that were made before even going to the hospital weren't picked up and um, and and they're still being discharged and they were given in the hospital medicines at different doses than they were getting previously. Um, so it's just it's so important to talk to families, um, ask them for a medication list, ask them what they're taking. Um, call the pharmacy if you need to, to find out when medications were last filled. Look at the pill bottles. This can be extremely helpful. Um, medication reconciliation is made even more challenging by the fact that patients often, our older patients, can have cognitive impairment and they'll tell you they're taking their medicines and they're taking them regularly. And if you actually look at the pill bottles, you can see that they're probably not actually taking medicines correctly. So, so medication um, noncompliance is a more is a complicating factor. But what I I try to do in the office is I ask patients to bring in all their medicines and I will look at them. I'll look at the date they were filled, the number of pills in the bottle, and try to assess: hmm, Do I think that they are taking this medication appropriate uh, consistently? Um, and, and very often you discover that, you know, I don't really think they're actually taking this medication. Um, and, and also if a patient's coming from a facility, make sure you, you try to find out what their facility, um, what the medication list. So this, this would be any assisted living, nursing home, or skilled rehab. At those facilities, they will, they have to have a facility med list. And so if there isn't one, when you see them in the office, have somebody, a medical assistant, um, call uh, the facility to get a list of medications. Um, if they're in the hospital, you can check the, the bedside chart to see if the, the list of medicines came with them or um, uh, call the facility for a med list. And I, I do wanna just shout out to pharmacy. Uh, our um, pharmacy department at CMC has really done an absolutely amazing job with their uh, intervention um, that uh, they started, um, I believe some point last year, uh, the pharmacy residents are all looking, they're um, reconciling medications for every admission to CMC. And they are really doing an absolutely fantastic job. So I encourage you all to look at, in the inpatient chart, um, look for the pharmacy education note, which is usually at um, the, in the beginning of the hospital stay. Um, and use that then as a basis to go over the medications with the um, patients and families. So just some take home points. Um, I, I advise mindfulness in prescribing. Think about your medicines before you prescribe them. First, make sure you actually know what your patients are really taking. And if you are gonna prescribe something, start low and go slow. And, and know how the medicine works. Know what the potential side effects are, what the half-life is, what um, the um, you know, potential pharmacokinetic changes um, in your individual patients, um, and, and reconcile your medication lists. If you have a patient who has a new symptom, first think potential adverse drug reaction. Could this, this symptom or complaint be related to something that a medication they're already on? Look at the pill bottles if they bring them in. It could be very helpful, particularly with compliance. And when you have a list of medications that you're concerned about, question each and every medicine. Just because a patient is prescribed, let's say, denepazil um, for memory loss, doesn't mean that the me that medicine is really appropriate for that patient. Um, ju just because a patient is prescribed a, you know, um, anything, any neurologic medication or um, it, it's okay to question things. Um, and, you know, if you need to talk to other providers, that can be helpful. Um, I often will send messages just, you know, saying I have concerns about the risks of, of um, uh, risks of side effects versus benefits. Um, and, and you can start that conversation. Um, and weigh, weigh the risks and benefits of each medication. And if you are gonna remove medications, you wanna do it in a stepwise fashion. Usually best to start with maybe one, one or two medicines at a time 
start with the medicines that are most likely not providing any benefit. Um, and, and then the medications that are doing potential harm. Um, and you'll want to see your patients regularly when you're taking um, medications off. So, uh, any questions? Thank you for a really great presentation. And thank you for everything you do for geriatric care and education at UH and UH system. Really grateful. Um, you know, a lot of people these days are using cannabis derivatives, particularly CBD. Do you see this in your population? CBDs become very mainstream. Oh yeah, um, I I get asked about it all the time. Um, less so lately because these products are just so readily available. Um, all all hemp based. Uh, products are not under regulation um, they, because uh, of uh, a farmer's union. Um, basically, they, they can't be touched. So when you see CBD counters uh, products over the counter, they're all, they all come from hemp, which is very similar. Um, basically, it's a different species of marijuana. Um, but yeah, I, I see patients using them all the time. My problem, I find, is that I just don't, I, I'm not I'm not very familiar with the uh, um, the different brands. How safe are they? I, none of these are regulated. So how you know do they actually have what they say they have in them, and are um, are they safe? That that is generally my concern. I, if people want to use these products, I ask them to try to make sure it's a reputable um, company and that there's lots of reviews and um, you know and just use with caution. Gotcha. And there's a question um, in the chat from Dr. Hojak, who is you know, our, uh, our antimicrobial stewardship champion. And I would say, Leo, it's always a UTI because there's one plus leucosterase in the urine. But a question is, could you comment on approaching evaluation for uh, polypharmacy that cause of change in mental status in the ED, considering that many of these patients receive unnecessary workup and treatment for, for other conditions like infections? Mm -hmm. Gosh, you have no idea how much um, geriatricians love that question because it is so frustrating to us. Um, I, I, it's getting better. Um, geriatricians are responsible for teaching the world um, back in maybe the 80s that older adults, if they have a urinary tract infection, they may be confused. However, unfortunately, that statement has then been, been taken to mean any older adult who's confused, it's a UTI. And um, I, again, I think it's a little bit better nowadays, but um, you know, over the last 13 years of my practice, all the time I am asked by uh, particularly nursing staff at facilities and family members, they'll say, you know, mom is just not right. Um, can we check a urine? And I always say, well, no. <laughs> First, tell me if there's are you having any any symptoms of a UTI? Are, you know, there's it can't just be confusion alone. There's got to be other symptoms and signs, um, and um, that's why the Loeb and McGreer criteria um, I encourage you all to take a look at, or it can be very helpful. Um, and and so the emergency room, it still happens an awful lot that um, you know one of my patients goes to the emergency room and they come back with a diagnosis of UTI and an antibiotic. Yeah. But is it really, is it really a UTI? Most of the time it's asymptomatic bacteria. Um, if you, if you were, especially in a, in a nursing home setting or, you know, facility setting, older adults often have abnormal urinary tracts and they have urine incontinence. So, there is a good chance that they're going to have some um, uh, white cells and bacteria, potentially colonization. And so um, if, you, if you check urine on people who are asymptomatic, a good percentage of them are going to have abnormal UAs and, and potentially urine cultures. And so um, I think what's more commonly the cause of, of um, confusion in our older patients is dehydration because so many patients don't drink enough. And I think that when you're seeing these patients in the emergency room or in the hospital, yeah, you, you need to think about, you know, okay, medications, uh, you know, are they taking their, their medicines correctly at home? 
Um, you know, are they drinking enough fluid? Are they eating enough? Because so often there's there's malnutrition as well that's playing a role. Um, and um, you, you know, not not necessarily jump to infection, especially if there aren't any other real symptoms or signs uh, of an infection. We have solidarity between ID and geriatrics, as always. Um, and, yes. uh, and, and uh, Dr. Chandra has his hand up. Hi, Amanda. Um, so you mentioned in your talk how uh, at transitions of care, you notice in the in the SNF setting, there's almost one, commonly one mistake on the med rec. So do you have any thoughts of how we can improve the process of considering that 35 to 40 percent of our patients are going to skilled facilities? And there is no way to hand off uh, from a physician standpoint to a physician in a SNF. We, we almost never can get a hold of anybody. Is there a way of our pharmacy or, or at least the pharmacy of the SNF uh, just communicating with the med list of some some way? I, and I don't know how, how easy or hard it is to do that so that transitions in medications are easier and, and more safe. I think, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I think that the problem comes with, it comes with the medicine reconciliation. Um, you know, and well, I think our our two two different um, EMR systems makes it very challenging. But that that problem is going to be much better as of September 30th when we have one system. That being said, you know, I practiced at Cleveland Clinic for 10 years where they had um, uh, Epic, and and there were still were very often um, really concerning. Um, errors on on discharge to home and also to um, to facilities, and um, I think it comes with it. It, it comes. Um, it's we have to do a better job of maintaining med lists um, and keeping them correct, just in general, just you know for primary care. And the problem is that um, there's nobody who owns a med list. It, you know, I, I try to, even, even when I see patients in the hospital, I will change their outpatient med list if there's medicines that they're clearly not taking anymore. So often patients, you know, will stop medications on their own. They'll be told to stop medicines um, in a telephone note um, or follow my health, but then those medicines are never removed. So um, I think that we have to do a better job of um, when when we have a patient admitted to the hospital and we reconcile their meds, there has to be a way to change the pre-admission med list to to make it clear to everyone what the pre-admission med list was supposed to be. Because I know when you go to discharge patients, at least in Epic, the the things that would come up is it, it for choice to choose is the pre-admission med list. And if that med list is wrong, then then you end up with with patients getting the wrong medicine. So we just, we have to find a, a, I mean, maybe it's something that we will look into with Epic. Um, we'll look at the process of discharge and, and what choices are being, um, are coming up when you're discharging the medication. Um, I, I think if we just spend a little bit more attention and time to that factor, so the medicine reconciliation and what medicines are being chose, in the, in the um, patient instructions, I think that'll help. And we, we probably have time for one last question. Amanda, there's a question in the chat about a role of multivitamins in elderly. But what is the role of taking multivitamins elderly routinely? Um, this, is, this is not clear. You know, a, as you know, that um, recent evidence over the last few years suggests that the multivitamins probably don't have play a significant role, um, you know, don't have um, significant um, outcomes. Um, you know, same with aspirin for primary prevention. But, you know, and this frustrates me too, because I see it all the time at Judson, um, patients who have malnutrition, what is the first, or wounds, what is the first thing that, that nutrition, um, the, the dietitian will recommend for these patients? Multivitamin, um, uh, magnesium, the protein supplements, vitamin C. Um, and is there evidence that these that vitamins and supplements actually improve wounds? No, there there isn't unfortunately. So I, I think I, I think that we have to weigh everything. And if these vitamins are 
you know, if it's contributing to the the pill burden, you know, they're probably they're probably not um, um, providing significant benefit and may be able to be decreased. I have to just say one thing because this really really bothers me. I see it a lot all the time lately in the hospital, and it's about thiamine. Um, I would like to, at some point, try to do a quality improvement study that looks at the cost effectiveness of just checking a whole blood thiamine level before we start giving patients tons of thiamine, because we are doing it like crazy all the time in the hospital. For any patient who's confused, we just give them thiamine, and there is no evidence that that is actually beneficial, and, um, you know, do they actually even need the thiamine? So, you know, we give IV thiamine over so many doses, that's probably really expensive. And, and you know, probably be a lot more cost effective to just check a whole blood thiamine level before you give thiamine. Um, just, just food for thought. Awesome idea of approach. Again, we're, we're bumming up against one o'clock. Thank you for everything you do and for a terrific presentation. Thanks.